Okay, thank you, Marty. And yeah, hello everyone. Um, uh, and thanks, thanks to Anne for the latest uh, market updates. It's always informative, and for Barry for uh, yeah some of the relative information, I guess, for feeding on a tough drought year like it is this year. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to take this time to go over a few of the nutritional disorders um, that we see in cattle. So we all know that proper nutrition is important, and uh, I guess first off, we want to maintain the health and welfare of the herd. Um, and obviously we want to feed um, to kind of match their genetic potential. So as there are improvements in your breeding programs, um, you want to make sure that your nutrition is going to match this. Um, also, yeah, just to, to be economically efficient as feeding, as you know, is the biggest cost of beef production. So we want to pay close attention to it, um, which involves, of course, not overfeeding or underfeeding nutrients to maximize the health of the herd and to minimize the loss, the costs associated with that. Now, a balanced diet is also important to hopefully prevent some of those nutritional diseases, which we're going to go over. So there are many potential nutritional disorders um, to consider. Um, I think Barry did a good job kind of going over a few that we might see on a year like this with a few different feeds and stuff. Um, I listed a few of them um, just kind of for reference, I guess. Um, of course, there's mineral and vitamin problems. If uh, they're low, of course, you can have deficiencies. And if they're too high, you can have toxicity. So important to keep these in balance. Um, there are functional problems with feeding that can occur. Um, this includes bloat and choke, uh, hardware disease type of infections and impactions. Um, there's also concerns with toxins in the feed and water, which are include nitrates, molds. We see some clover poisoning among others. So we're not going to go over all these disorders sort of in the time that we have here, but uh, just focus on a few of the most relevant. So first off, how, how do we avoid nutritional problems? Um, you want to have a feeding plan in place that will be based on what you have available. Um, this may involve testing the feed, which is more important if you're using unfamiliar feeds. Uh, you want to decide what supplements that you will have, have to use, I guess, to maintain a balanced ration. Um, yeah, you might need the expertise of a nutritionist or to use some computer software to help you through that. Uh, then you want to consider changes that are needed through the feeding period, such as after calving or during periods of extreme weather um, when their nutritional needs increase. It's a good idea to pay close attention to individual and herd body conditions and to feed accordingly, uh, which may involve separating them into different groups. If you want to observe the cows um, through the you want to observe the cows through the feeding period to see how it is working, if there's any changes in body condition, and to monitor the cows' uh, fecal output. There's a good idea. If it's too watery, maybe a sign that there's more fiber could be used in the diet, which would hopefully slow slow down their digestion and allow more time um, to absorb some of the nutrients that they've broken down. Well, if the stool's too dry, maybe a clue that the protein or energy levels are too low. So. Um, it's also important to become familiar with common nutritional disorders so that you can identify any problems early and treat if necessary. So that's kind of what we'll attempt to do here. Um, of course, there's also regional nutritional disorders. So which well, yeah, so you see different diseases in different areas. And of course, that's impacted by soil type, um, the weather and the types of crops that are grown in that area. So it's good to keep these in mind, especially if you're using feed from an outside source. Um, and it's important to select mineral supplements that have been developed for your specific region. Problems that arise um, do vary with how crops have been harvested and with how they are fed to the cattle. So it's good to think about those as well. So I just, again, with, yeah, just the many different things that we can see, I guess, with feeding. I, I thought I'd just focus on some of the disorders that we kind of see at our practice. Um, in some cases there, yeah, you want to make sure that you can identify them early to prevent any losses. Uh, grass tetany is a condition when the magnesium levels become too low, uh, can cause muscle twitching similar to tetanus, so kind of where the name comes from, um, as magnesium plays an important role in nerve function. Um, there are a few different reasons why a cow will bloat, but usually it's seen when feeding alfalfa. Grain overload is also referred to acidosis or ruminitis, which we'll go over. Um, milk fever caused by low blood calcium in high milk producing cows. 
It's a poorly named disease actually, as it usually causes a decrease in body temperature. Um, hardware disease is a common disease that we see. Um, and then of course, selenium deficiency, which is another disease seen a lot in this area. It's also referred to as white muscle disease in camps. So we'll start off by going over grass tetany. Um, it is caused by low levels of magnesium again. Um, and usually seen in cattle grazing ryegrass, fescue, or orchard grass in the fall. We tend to see it most often when swath grazing cereal crops. Um, cattle do not regulate magnesium levels very well, so they rely on daily intake to maintain these levels. Um, the amount they consume each day may be impacted by adverse weather conditions. So if we tend to see cows that go down with grass tetany, it's, yeah, it's often during like really cold snaps through the winter when they're maybe not moving around and eating as much. So what are some of the signs to watch for grass tetany? Um, yeah, with it affecting the nerves, we tend to see nervousness, um, muscle twitching, staggering, or often these cows are just down and you might see just a slight twitching kind of in their eyelids. So those muscles tend to be affected as well. Uh, prevention um, for grass tetany involves just managing your pastures to make sure there's enough legumes in the grass mix that have higher magnesium um, levels. And important to supplement during periods of concern. So, um, so yeah, just to make sure you have a good uh, mineral out there if you are swath grazing. So when we uh, attempt to diagnose um, grass tetany, it, usually involves examining the cow to make sure that there's not another reason that she's down if she injured herself or if she was sick for another reason. Um, so, and usually we'll confirm that with a blood test. Uh, it's important to treat this condition early if you want to have a success, uh, successful outcome as the longer it goes on, the less likely they'll respond to treatment. Um, we usually give magnesium intravenously um, along with calcium and phosphorus as these levels are often low as well. Um, and cows will usually respond within, say, four to six hours after we treat them. Uh, it's just a picture of a, a cow down in the field, but that's often how we kind of see grass tetany present itself. Uh, and this is just one of the many treatments sort of available uh, commercially for grass tetany. So moving on to bloat, it's a result of gas produced in the room and that's that normally the cow would burp that out. Um, if you see that there's, if you see it, there's usually something preventing the gas from escaping out through the esophagus. And if it progresses, it can cause enough pressure inside the belly to compress, yeah, it compresses on their diaphragm and squishes their lungs and then they can't breathe. Um, with, with bloat, you would always see the cow distended high up on the left side of her flank. Um, and that's because that's where the rumen is sitting. So. There are many different causes of bloat, um, but we usually divide them kind of into two main types. The first being a free gas bloat. And this can have a variety of causes, which includes obstructions, choke, grain overload, or if the animal gets off on her side and becomes casted. This type of bloat can usually be resolved by passing a stomach tube. Now, the other type is a frothy bloat, which is uh, when stable foam forms inside the rumen. Um, and this, this type of bloat cannot be relieved with a stomach tube. Um, usually if you pass a tube in these cows, then yeah, you won't get any gas out. And when you pull the tube out, you'll see just a little bit of foam kind of on the end of the tube. So this is what a cow looks like when she's bloated, if you haven't seen one. But uh, so this cow, yeah, she presents with a typical high up distension on the left side um, and distension kind of lower down on the right side. It's often referred to as a papal shaped abdomen, kind of apple on the left and pear on the right, I guess. Um, and the di diagram at the bottom points to this, the region of the cow, which is uh, distended um, when the rumen fills up with gas. So this is, if you were in an emergency where the cow was down, unable to breathe, then, then this is where you would puncture her to relieve some of that gas. Um, so if you see a cow, cow that's bloated, the first thing you want to do, yeah, make sure that you start treating her as soon as possible. Um, you want to get her up and moving, 
at the very least, if if she is on her side, you want to roll her up um, so that she won't continue to bloat. Um, as long as they're not in respiratory distress, um, you want to pass a stomach tube. Um, if, if they're already struggling to breathe, sometimes the stress of trying to pass a tube will be enough to, to put them over the edge. So, um, And if you're suspecting an alfalfa bloat, you want to give a surfactant such as anti-gas to break up the bubbles of air. Uh, we often see people use anti-gas for a free gas bloat, but it actually is, is not a very good treatment for that. Um, and if the cow is in respiratory distress, then that's the time when you'd want to puncture <laughs> puncture a rumen with a large needle or knife. Um, and this should only be done if the cow is struggling to breathe as, yeah, it can cause some infection and yeah, which can be a bad thing obviously too. So. Well, these are just a few of the, the tools that we use to treat cases of bloat at the clinic. Um, this is a stomach tube at the top here, which is usually around nine feet long. Um, this next picture here is of a, a, what we call a Frick speculum. Um, so it's it's kind of a, yeah, it's a steel tube that you put in in the cow's mouth first, and that just prevents her from chewing on the tube. Um, this is the type of stomach tube that we use. It's just a hand hand pump to, to give liquid treatments like anti-gas, but you could also use a funnel. Um, this, is, this is one example of a surfactant to break up gas bubbles for a, for a frothy bloat. And this is a type of trocar if, if you did have to puncture the rumen. Um, these ones are a little bit better than just using a big knife because you can see it threads into the cow, so it, it'll actually prevent the bacteria from spilling into the abdomen and causing infection. So, so there'd probably be a better route to go there. They're not very sharp on the end, so generally we'd have to use a knife or a scalpel blade to puncture through the skin first to be able to put those in. So yeah, if you're concerned about, yeah, with your feeding program about cases of bloat, then you'd want to make sure that you had something like this on hand that could do the same job. Well, it's a picture of a cow. I'm just demonstrating a Frick speculum in her mouth, um, which allows the stomach tube to pass. Um, when the speculum is, is in the cow's mouth, the tube usually passes quite easily. Um, this cow has her head constrained, but but often if you can get the speculum into their mouth, um, yeah, they, they tend to cooperate fairly well. Uh, this is a picture of a local farmer who some of you may recognize, um, just shown here using a stomach pump. Uh, this cow must have been a little unruly. She went down, which is probably not the best way to pump pump stomach into her, but, uh, but it looks like it's working, so. Uh, so some preventions for bloat. Um, include, yeah, again, managing pastures so there's a good balance of grasses to legumes. Um, if we can introduce legumes gradually in the diet. Um, and when grazing alfalfa in the summer, it's a good idea to have have the cows full of grass hay be before turning them out on the pasture. Um, it's also a good practice to allow um, access only for a few hours for the first few days until the cows get used, used to a high legume diet. Uh, feeding rumensin um, is also kind of a known cause to help prevent bloat. And this can be given in the mineral or mixed in with grain or pellets. Um, there are, are also boluses that are available that uh, slowly release rumensin into the cow's stomach. So grain overload is another condition that we see, which, which happens sort of as the name implies, um, when a cow has a sudden change from a forage-based diet to a high grain diet. It's most often seen in calves that are exposed too quickly to a high grain diet, which can happen with self feeders um, and when trying to finish calves. When this happens, the bacteria in the rumen produce uh, quite an excess of acid which causes the animal to go off feed because of this acidosis and indigestion. Um, the animal often becomes dehydrated from not eating um, and body fluid going into the rumen um, and bloated because the stomach stops contracting from the excess acid. The low pH environment does cause damage to the stomach wall and can allow bacteria into the bloodstream, which are transported to the liver, which can cause um, liver abscesses to form. So because of these things that the treatments for grain 
overload or, or kind of, yeah, basically uh, yeah, trying to get a tube into them if they're they're bloated to relieve that gas and the pressure. Um, and then we'll we'll mix up an alkalizing agent such as oximin or rumen RX powder um, and give as a drench to help neutralize the acid. And then we'll we'll always give a long acting antibiotic um, to prevent liver abscesses from forming. Um, and often we'll give a painkiller to make sure the cow yeah keeps keeps standing and moving around. Well, prevention practices include starting again starting on small amounts of grain and slowly increasing it into the ration to the desired levels over a few weeks. Um, and remensin again in the diet has been shown to help prevent grain overload. So these are just a pictures of a few treatments that we have available for grain overload. I guess no vet talk would be complete without a little bit of pathology, I guess, but uh, so actually just this week we had had a case of grain overload where some cows, yeah, they actually broke down the gate in front of the calf self feeder and uh, helped themselves to a mixture of barley and oats. Um, yeah, this cow, she unfortunately didn't make it, I guess. And uh, yeah, she was found the next morning out in the field just with her room and distended full of grain. Uh, you can kind of see in the picture here, she walked, she had walked out to this recently plowed area of the field just before she died. So. I couldn't get my truck out there, so we had to take the side by side to that you can kind of see in the back corner here. And this is what happened when, uh, from parking too close to the cow when I opened her up. So, <laughs> so this is yeah. There was it would have been nice to catch that on video. I guess I might be famous on TikTok or something. But uh, so anyway, there's so much pressure in a room, and that, and with it being so full of grain, that that it, it just was like a fountain and shot up over the side by side and made a big mess here. So so I thought I'd go over milk fever, um, even though it's, it's predominantly a dairy cow issue, but we, we do see a lot of producers that, that have a few nurse cows around. Um, and unfortunately, often these nurse cows, um, yeah, they, they've been sold, I guess, because they've had problems. That's why they're not in the milk barn anymore. So milk fever is caused by low blood calcium. Um, it usually presents itself after calving due to, due to the milk production. Um, calcium is important for muscle contraction, um, which is why we tend to see muscle stiffness or tremors, or often these cows just present being down. Well, this diagram just shows kind of the incidence of milk fever in a, in a modern dairy cow. Um, you know, just with their such high milk production, it's, it is a very common disease. So yeah, it sort of measures the blood levels on the left here and just shows the days to calving at the bottom. So yeah, as high as 10% of them have been found to, to suffer from, from clinical milk fever and close to half of them often will have subclinical milk fever. And it, it just proves to be a very difficult time to uh, feed the cows the appropriate amount of calcium to to sort of compensate for this really low um, drop that happens at calving. So to diagnose milk fever, it's very similar to grass tetany. Um, yeah, a, a blood test is, is what we use to, to confirm it. Um, and if, if we treat them, they often respond, yeah, very quickly, sometimes even within a few minutes to, to IV. Um, we do have to be a little bit careful with IV as if, if you do give them too much um, it can actually put them into cardiac arrest. So, so often as we're running the calcium into the cow, we'll, we'll listen to their heart to make sure there aren't any murmurs or anything started that might uh, make us want to stop treatment a little bit earlier. Um, there are calcium boluses available, um, and they're kind of nice as they're, they're kind of a longer lasting calcium treatment than an intravenous is. Um, but um, they warn to not give to cows that are down as often these cows are unable to swallow properly. And, and that can cause some damage to the esophagus. Um, but often we'll use them in, if we've treated a cow with an IV and she's responded, then we'll give her some boluses afterwards to, to prevent her from relapsing. So the prevention um, for milk fever um, is, would be aimed mostly at yeah, trying to feed a balanced ration and then using boluses to cows that would be considered high risk. Um, this would include dairy cows that are on their third or more lactation. 
Uh, most of these boluses are designed to give the day that she calves and a second one the next day. Uh, this is just a picture of a few different types of calcium boluses that are available. Um, there are quite a few of them now as, as they're used very commonly in, in dairy farms. And the pictures don't really show it, but they're very large boluses and they, they require kind of a specific balling gun to deliver them. So we, if you if you have a nurse cow that you'd like using this on, we have a few of these balling guns available that you can just borrow at the clinic here. So, so not really a, a feed necessarily disease itself, but just a feed related disease, this um, hardware disease. I thought I'd go over it just, just because it is such a common thing that we do see. Um, it, it occurs when sharp objects are ingested and, and they end up puncturing the stomach wall. Um, the symptoms that you see in the cow, they'll, they'll vary depending on where the puncture occurs. Um, the cows usually have a loss of appetite and abdominal pain, and we'll often see swelling in the brisket region if the puncture penetrates close to the cow's heart. So if you've had issues with hardware disease, uh, rumen magnets are an inexpensive preventative. You may want to consider putting them into all the cows, or if, if you haven't been doing it, you could start um, kind of with the replacement heifers by uh, popping one into them um, in the spring before they go to pasture. Um, some feeding equipment can also be fitted with magnets, which may help. Um, treatment for hardware disease um, usually requires multiple doses of a long-acting antibiotic as it is a chronic condition. Um, and I'll just mention we have used surgery just a little bit on some high valuable animals. There are a few different types of rumen magnets. Um, the one on the left, these are kind of a ceramic coated magnet. I think they, yeah, they tend not to, to rust. They tend to be not quite as a strong a magnet as the stainless steel ones that are on the right. Um, and then lastly, I'll just go over selenium deficiency. That's uh, definitely a common disease in our area. It causes white muscle disease in calves. It can affect the heart muscle, which often leads to sudden death. This is the where the name comes from is afterwards you'll see white streaks through the heart muscle, which is how we diagnose it. Um, but more commonly, we would see calves that are weak in the hind end. And it's just a result of cows consuming selenium deficient diets through their gestation. Now, treatment for selenium deficiency is with an intramuscular injection. Um, they often resolve quickly within a day or so. Um, they store selenium for approximately two weeks, so um, another injection can be given at that time. Prevention involves supplementing the cows through her gestation. Um, or you can give selenium injections to the cows roughly about a month before she calves so that she can pass that on through to the fetus. So if you're wondering how your nutrition program is going, um, um, again, I, farmers, yeah, definitely in this area, they're the experts when it comes to feeding cattle as they have the experience for what works well. Um, but if you have concerns about your feed or you'd like to monitor it a little bit closer, then testing is a good option, especially if you're using some unfamiliar feeds. Um, you can also test individual animals by doing blood tests or less commonly, we've done liver samples from cows and calves. Well, monitoring, monitoring the herd is also another easy way to, to see how things are going. So in, in summary, I, I'm hoping this review just kind of help you maybe identify a few of the common disorders that we see and um, initiate treatment nice and early. Um, although this is just kind of a brief summary of disorders, so I just hope it gets you thinking a little bit about ways to prevent feed related problems and just be prepared for any emergencies that may arise within your particular feeding system. And that's all about, that's pretty much all I had. So yeah, I just want to thank the, the county, I guess, for this opportunity to present to you. And as always, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us at the clinic. So.